back into regular session. Um, uh, the um, Board of Supervisors is now meeting in regular session for all uh, matters that come before the Board as well as any taxing and assessment districts for which this Board so acts. We're going to open with Pledge of Allegiance and ask Supervisor Sullivan to lead us. Council, did we have any action arising out of closed session? No reportable actions today. Okay. So at this time, I'd ask for the introduction of any new employees. Jay? Well, I'm pleased to introduce Barbara Pearson. She's the new Health and Human Services Director. And if, Barbara, if you could come up and maybe <laughs> say hi. Yeah. No. Her first day was <laughs> yesterday, and so she's probably got everything taken care of and ready to roll. And she's still here. Yeah. I am still here, but well, it was welcome. a great day. Um, I'm meeting a lot of people who have some amazing talents, and so we're just going to we have our first program managers meeting this afternoon, so I'll get to meet the rest of the staff, and um, it's all good so far. Well, welcome, Barbara. Thank you for looking forward to it. the opportunity. Thank you. At this time, the chair requests any deletions, corrections, or additions to uh, any matter to come before the board. In order to have a matter come before the board that requires action, um, it will, would have had to have come subsequent to posting the agenda and requiring action prior to our next meeting. So is there any of those emergency items? No? Okay. So we're going to receive brief reports or announcements from fellow supervisors, and we're going to start with Supervisor Sullivan. Thank you. Um, it's been a busy couple weeks. Uh, attended the, as the chairman of the local transportation commission, which I'm sure you've all read in the paper at some point, my name's come up. So um, it'd be nice to have some facts behind it, but we'll, hopefully we'll have some coming up. Um, attended the healthcare district, got a unanimous support and um, a, a letter of support for Highway 199, 197 due to the healthcare issues if that highway fails and the ongoing safety issues with it, which is the point behind the project is to make it a safer highway. Uh, also, then ran from there, went over to the climate change meeting they had on last chance grade. So for a, in a unique way, uh, last chance grade has been highlighted in California as one of the areas that in a climate change situation, it could fail. Well, we've all known that, so it's you, whatever way you want to get it fixed, I'm good with that. So um, anyway, it's good to see Caltrans, is, it's kind of a, they're doing a study right now and and it's nice to see all the different naysayers actually start coming to the table with the realization if you are not at the table and that thing fails, it's going to go right through anyway. So wouldn't you rather have some input in the process? Um, also, uh, that later that week, I uh, went uh, with my son and uh, my brother and uh, his family. We went and watched the opening game for the Oregon State Beavers, watched them beat Portland State. Uh, which Corvallis is a great town if you've ever had a chance to visit there. Uh, a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, I think we have enough black and orange now to uh, keep us dressed for a while on that too. Um, but I did get a chance to, went up a day early and got a chance to meet with Jay and Kim Freeman, who Jay was involved in the community. They both, both were involved in the community a lot and they've uh, moved up to Morton, Washington. And uh, it was great to see their, their new place and, and they're doing, anyway, they're doing really well. Um, attended a special session uh, with, uh, for our new Health and Human Services uh, Director to, to a point. Uh, and then I went to the CSAC meeting. Um, and I'm sure Supervisor Finnegan will expand even more than I do. But um, uh, it was a good meeting. We, uh, it's, it's a quarterly meeting that the California State Association of Counties has. And we were, in this one, they were looking for some kind of support for different support or opposition or neutral, neutrality on uh, Proposition 1, which is the Water Quality Supply and Infrastructure Improvement Act, uh, the CSAC did endorse that. Um, it is uh, kind of the first bond um, issue. This water thing's been floating around for a, f uh, for a few years, and obviously right now, this year, we really need storage as one of the big items in there that needs to happen. Uh, there's a lot of runoff on water that doesn't get captured, and obviously the thirstiest part of the state is in Southern California. So. Um, we, we have low water supply, but we're not in any kind of the drought situation they are down there. 
Uh, also talked about Proposition 2, which was building a state reserve policy. So in other words, in good times, they have to start putting money off to the side in reserve, which is, is a wise idea. It should have been put in place a long time ago. Uh, Proposition 46 was the Troy and Alana um, Patient Safety Act. And, um, and I, I'll let Supervisor Figan expand on that one. And then the other one, Proposition 47, uh, Safe Neighborhoods and Schools Act. Um, you need to really dig into 47. It's sometimes the title of the proposition isn't really what it's about. Um, I think we've seen those before. So I would really look at Proposition 47 to see if you want to vote for it or not. Um, because there's a lot of pieces in there that just aren't making a lot of sense. It doesn't jive with the title, basically. Um, then we uh, finished up and we had a realignment allocation committee report, um, then the legislative update. Um, and uh, just there's a ton of legislation that uh, is in front of the governor to, to be signed or hopefully to be vetoed. Um, and also, uh, and, and more recently attended the Republican dinner last uh, Saturday. It was in the paper. I uh, got to see almost all of the Republican candidates for, for state office that we we're going to have a chance to vote on. Um, Neil Kashkari uh, was very impressive. Um, he, he came with a really solid message, comes from a middle class background, and really that's been his, his focus. Uh, the guy was really eloquent. I, th I thought he, he kind of nailed it uh, during the presentation. So a lot of good speakers. Uh, it was at the Alexander uh, Ranch. Uh, we got to see where they store their eggs for now that they're selling Costco. Um, and it was indoors this year because last year got a little cold at the end of the evening. This year it was a really neat setup. They had the kids from the Grange, 4-H. Um, and uh, I think FFA were also um, helping serve the dinner, and it was, you know, organic beef and the whole thing. It was a cool setup. So, anyway, uh, great event. They did a great job planning it. So, that's it. Good. Supervisor McClure. Thank you. Um, during the last couple of weeks, I have a, um, participated in the end of the season for the Red Redwood Park Association. Um, dinner and at the the RPA has done an incredible job of our sales are over the top and all of our money that we earn goes back to the parks to do mapping and educational um, activities and so that is working really well and the the team that pulls it together the seven full-time employees do just such an incredible job of making sure that a visitor that their, that their experience here is a, is a good one and that people come back year after year. In fact, we received several letters this season from people who came and said it was just unbelievable to enter the Redwood Forest and to be part of it, that, that it was lifetime experience and that they would be back. So that is always good to know that our tourists are having a good experience and coming back is the main thing. We had a senior center meeting and at the senior center meeting, we have a bit of a um, problem in relationship to the California Department on Aging and the funding for the meals programs. Um, when, the, when the budget is drawn up, there, there are two categories for meals, and one is the meal at the center and one is the home delivered meal. And at the beginning of their fiscal year, it's very difficult to determine which meals, which one is going to have the most, depending, it depends on the winter, it depends on transportation, it's, it's very, it's like looking into a crystal ball. And currently, because CDBG has not come through, there's no backfill, and it looks as though there's about a $21,000 um, deficit for the first three months of the food program, and so we're trying to figure out how we can keep it rolling and keep it going. Chesbro's office has weighed in and they're assisting us and it looks like CDBG is going to be um, announced in the next two weeks. So that's, a, that's helpful, but it is a problem with um, California Department on Aging and we need, to, we need to, them to look at their rules a little better because the two meals come out of the same kitchen and it's all the same food but we can't transfer the money back and forth depending on how many people want a home delivered meal and how many people want a, um, a center delivered meal. So it's, we're, we're working on that budget 
problem and Chesbro's office is helping us so that's a that's a good thing um, I participated and hosted in the um, Central Com Democratic Central Committee we hosted a um, breakfast with Congressman um, Huffman and he was here and he is um, one of his number one concerns is what's going to happen with our postal system because we are likely to have a couple of our post offices actually close and the processing center change which could equal a delay in our mail service by three or to four days and that is something that if people would write a letter to the senators to anyone that you could think of that might be on you can go online and look at which ones are dealing with the postal service and encourage them to make sure that rural post offices stay open because it would mean the loss of lots of um, P.O. boxes and many many people in our community rely on that P.O. box because we have what I refer to as bicycle bandits that have a tendency to peek in other people's mailboxes and so people have resorted to having the P.O. box and we need to make sure that that stays open so anyone that wants to weigh in it's time to weigh in and hopefully we can get Congress to understand the significance of a rural post office. I also did a um, participated in a free Labor Day breakfast at um, again at the senior center, and we had pancakes and eggs and had a, a really nice turnout. I also participated in the special meeting um, to hire Barbara in welcome, and um, I also attended the meeting on the climate change and realized that. To me, I felt that the presenters weren't really connected with the uplift that we're having from the Mendocino Coast North, and they really didn't address that for me, but I think at least we have attention happening on what's going to happen, especially when people realize that the, um, the king tides are really significant in, in bluff erosion, and that is one of the things that we should be concerned with and that's one of the things with the toe of the bluff at last chance grade that that is where we need to really figure out last chance grade um, I I walked um, I, I walked South Beach one day to look at the damage from the fires and um, the brush is so thick in there that I'm hoping that we can take a look at that brush and figure out how we could get some of the understory Re, uh, removed in order to um, more pr protect our that little dune system that's there rather than seeing it just go up in flames because I think that that is not what we want to have when people come into our community to see a beach that's been burned so that was that one and then the Coastal Commission meeting I've been preparing for that and the Coastal Commission meeting is going to be in Del Norte County we open tomorrow at 9 o'clock and it's at the Smith River Rancheria. It's a two-day meeting, and there will be a um, tour where they're gonna look at different projects and activities that are going on in the county, and the public is more than welcome to attend and to participate, and that tour, I think, will start tomorrow at about 2 p.m., <coughs> and it'll take a look at different parts of the county. Um, and I think that's it. Chair, Chair Finnegan, could I, I, I found my notes on the two, um, and so I'll, I'll spare you having to Good. go too much on these, but Proposition 46 um, was the Troy and Alana PAC Patient Safety Act of 2014 that's on the ballot. Uh, CSAC took an opposition to it, uh, we're opposed to it. And so what happened, just to give you a little background, uh, there was a Medical Injury Compensation Reform Act uh, passed by Governor Brown in 1975, and it capped basically pain and suffering from medical malpra uh, malpractice. So uh, the non-economic damages were capped at 250,000. That's where they've been since then. Um, so what this bill wants to do is it would raise the non-economic damages, pain and suffering, uh, for medical malpractice from 250 to approximately 1.1 million. And then it was attached to CPI or an inflation index to it afterwards. So the attorney's gonna make a lot of money on this thing. Uh, and I think 
this is pri the primary genesis as to why they're putting this on is so that more money can be, be got through lawsuits. Require hospitals to randomly test physicians for alcohol and drug use. Requires physicians to submit to substance abuse uh, tests within 24 hours after an adverse event. It requires medical professionals to report suspected drug or alcohol impairment or failure to follow the appropriate standard of care to the State Medical Board of California. Uh, requires physicians to pay for the cost of the substance, uh, substance use tests. Requires hospitals to report any positive test results, test results or refusals of a doctor to submit the test to the board. Um, and then requires health professionals and pharmacists to consult the controlled substance utilization review and evaluation system cures maintained by the State Department of Justice prior to prescribing or dispensing controlled substances to a patient for the first time. So there are some good things written in it. I mean, obviously, we'd want you want your doctor to be in good shape and not, not abusing drugs or alcohol, obviously. But the key component was the first thing I read to you is they want to be able to sue for more money on the pain and suffering, which is ridiculous. Our, our court system is, is ridiculous as it is. Uh, so CSAC took an opposition to that. The other one was uh, Prop 47. Uh, this was the, um, the safe, uh, safe neighborhoods uh, proposition ballot. And basically what would happen um, is they would, within this, they would reduce penalties for certain offenders convicted of a non-serious and non-violent drug and property crimes, um, allow persons currently incarcerated for these specified non-serious, non-violent crimes to seek resentencing, create a mechanism for, by which state correction system savings associated with these sentencing changes would be calculated. This was very vague. We could not get a straight answer from the proponent of, of Proposition 47. How are you going to determine those savings? Um, there really wasn't a way to calculate it. And then um, fourth, redirect identified state savings to three categories of prevention and treatment. So um, what ended up happening on this one is CSAC did take an opposition vote to it. I got a couple phone calls before it went down saying take a neutral vote on it. Um, the, uh, the biggest complaint was from the rural areas where we see a lot of this stuff a little more face-to-face uh, -face, uh, than I think some of the other areas do. So anyway, that was the, those are the two, proposi two of the major propositions mm -hmm. on the ballot. So, Supervisor Hemmingson. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, as, the, uh, uh, as was uh, brought up earlier, I, did, I also attended the uh, climate change study that Caltrans uh, is working on, and, and this is a... Um, a study that's going to go out a hundred years. They, when they build infrastructure now, they want to look a hundred years from now, and, and how that's going to hold up. And with this climate change, um, and if there is ever uh, sea level rise in our area, um, they want to compute that into the models so they know uh, what they're dealing with. And it wasn't just last chance grade, which uh, was a, a big component, and that's I think why most everybody was there. But we've also got an issue if there is a sea level rise. Um, with the uh, with uh, Highway 101 um, and South Beach, um, if that water comes up, we may want to raise that road up uh, rather than relocating it. Uh, um, we may want to just raise it up so that the, the water doesn't have an effect there. But anyway, I, I thought it was a, a pretty good meeting. They, uh, uh, I think the the whole concept is good. Uh, I hope they uh, uh, do a good job with it. Uh, I had a meeting with staff. Um, on the possibility of uh, closing part of Bailey Road. So we're working on that. Um, had a resource conservation district meeting and most of that discussion had to do with, uh, with the elk issues and elk management. Um, attended the special meeting that we had to hire our new Health and Human Services Director. Welcome again. Um, had a uh, Border Coast Regional Airport Authority meeting where we, uh, and actually I wasn't part of it, I had to recuse myself because of who the bid went to, but uh, we awarded the contract for the RSA improvement, which is a huge step. Um, finally uh, able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, um, and we're actually going to have construction start soon. So that's really good. Um, I did attend the dinner at the ranch, uh, food was very good. Um, and uh, yesterday we had Border Coast uh, Airport Authority uh, director interviews, um, and we'll see how that all turns out. That was it for me. Oh, uh, you know, there is one thing. Um, I would like to thank uh, IT. I don't know what they've done, but uh, this last uh, agenda seemed to come through a lot more easily to the Google Drive. Uh, pretty happy about that. Um, but also, uh, at the last, uh, 
Sustainable Forest Action Coalition meeting, um, we, we, we've been working with Chico State on a socioeconomic um, study or plan uh, to help with the NEPA process in, in forest management. Uh, it seems like the socioeconomic uh, portion is always a page or two where your environmental document is 40 pages or 50 pages. And so they don't spend much time on that impact that happens, especially to rural counties, when the Forest Service does do something in the forest, some sort of management or commercial operation, and if they don't. So uh, we'd like to see, uh, see what we can do to help uh, uh, put something in place uh, to move that along so that the impacts are really uh, well thought out and, and what it really does uh, um, what it really does when they don't do anything and when they do do something so um, they're asking for a, a contribution to help this process along this this SFAC group the sustainable forest action coalition is all voluntary um, nobody gets paid for any of it and uh, there's uh, some things that they want to put together to try to get this socioeconomic uh, element uh, in the, uh, or at least a good portion of it in the NEPA documents. And so I would like this board to direct staff to see if we can't help some funding. They're only looking for about $500 from every participating county. So if there's a way that we can help out, I'd like the board to direct staff to look into that if, uh, if that's okay. And that's it for me. Thank you. Supervisor Gitlin. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I'll try not to be too repetitive because um, my colleagues have mentioned several meetings they've attended. I too. The evening of our last meeting, I also attended the last chance grade information meeting at the Tolova Conference Center, and it's presented by Caltrans and the engineering consulting firm of GHD, which, according to GHD, uh, delivered a well. They delivered a very sobering view of our future, which shows oceans are growing and the shoreline is receding. According to GHD, temperatures may rise anywhere from one to three degrees um, over the next hundred years globally. Uh, I'm certainly not in a position <clears throat> to question the theory of global warming, but I maintain that <clears throat> if this position that GHD reports is even partially accurate, dramatic changes in our geography will result, and the report centered on how the, this theory will affect California's coastal transportation routes, including last chance grade, uh, stakeholders and the public weighed in on how to deal with these challenges. There are a number of different ways, including seawalls and moving of roads. All, all presented surveys on priorities regarding roads improvement, uh, and uh, we'll just have to wait and see as things proceed on how we'll deal with last chance grade. It's certainly on the top of everyone's radar screen. Uh, after Labor Day, the board announced, and Barbara, I'm going to mention your name again, uh, to announce the appointment of Barbara Pearson as the new Director of Health and Human Services. I I believe Barbara used to be here as director of Open Door uh, some years back. So you're coming back to Delnor County and welcome back. And you come to us from Lassen County where you were the director of behavioral health. So welcome aboard. Uh, I attended the A1 Agency on Aging meeting in Eureka uh, this past week. Um, the much focused group is in the process of developing a survey for seniors on their wants and needs here in Delnor County. The results of that survey, which all seniors will soon receive, will help serve housing, transportation, entertainment, and nutritional needs of this growing population in Del Norte County. And I want to say a big thank you to the chart room who's providing a dinner for two as part of a drawing as an incentive for seniors to return the survey. Thank you, chart room. I met with the management of Crescent Elk Hardware and Walmart who reported to me the problem of loitering, panhandling, and other socially unacceptable behaviors in and around the parking lots of both of those businesses. We'll be looking at interventions in alleviating this chronic problem, which has contributed also to criminal activity. Uh, I'll report to the board specific remedies of a law enforcement community uh, development officers will recommend when we meet this Friday at 9 a.m. at the CDD office uh, conference room. Uh, I just learned Caltrans is uh, going to close the Klamath Bridge again, so be prepared. It's Sunday night, 10 o'clock, 10 p.m., um, until 4 a.m. Monday morning, the 29th, so please make your plans accordingly. 
uh, also attended the Del Norte County Republican dinner, hosted its annual fundraising uh, effort at Alexander Derry's. It was a great event. Um, about 200 people were in attendance. Uh, thanks to all, and especially the Alexander family and uh, the kids who helped organize the event, including the local 4-H youth and the Grange, who did the serving of the meals. Um, all, all the Republican candidates for state, county, and city office uh, attended this event. Uh, also met to set the agenda for tomorrow's Del Norte Solid Waste Management meeting. Uh, yesterday, Northern Night Sea Cruise Car Show Visitors Bureau met and plans are falling into place for the 23rd Annual Sea Cruise Car Show, which will be held October 10th, 11th, starting with Show and Shine on 3rd Street on Friday and the car show Saturday and the dance Saturday night. I hope you'll make your plans to participate in this great annual event. Uh, finally met with Trees of Mystery Principals John and Debbie Thompson last week, who related to me uh, the day before Labor Day, over 5,000 folks stopped in at Trees. Another 2,500 individuals showed up on Labor Day. Trees of Mystery has enjoyed its greatest summer ever. Trees of Mystery is a great example of how to bring prosperity into Del Norte County. I'm very proud to report that Del Norte Re County Republican Party has embraced in its local format the priority of economic stimulation and the goal of bringing good career opportunities to Del Norte County. <clears throat> in the coming weeks, I hope to encourage both the City Council and our Board of Supervisors to look at new ways to attract good paying jobs in our community. It's all about economic stimulation, the bringing in of outside money into Del Norte County, which will be the vehicle to stimulate our local economy. And that's my report. Okay. I also had a couple of meetings. Uh, I, like the rest of the supervisors, attended Caltrans uh, Global Warming at the Elk Valley Rancheria, focusing on, somewhat focusing on last chance grade, but there was focus on South Beach and other, uh, other places in Smith River as well. I also, like the rest of us, attended the uh, special session of the Board of Supervisors where I hired a new Department of Health and Social Services. Welcome, Barbara. Uh, CSAC Financial uh, Corporation participated in a call as a board member. Had, as uh, Supervisor Hemmingson uh, said, a meeting with the airport JPA where we had a, a banner day. We let out uh, contracts, multi-million dollar contracts. It might have been close to 19 million, I think. Um, for construction, which will begin at the end of this month. Uh, also for um, the environmental aspect of it, as well as the remediation, as well as the actual construction of the runway safety area. We also enjoyed uh, getting to know that I think it was about a two and a half million dollar grant that was awarded, so we took in some money as well. Um, and I believe last night there was a presentation up in Brookings that'll take place with our Border Coast Economic Development Authority later. There was $400,000 that was delivered to Brookings, through Brookings, um, to the Border Coast Regional Airport Authority, Brookings being a partner there. And that's $400,000 that they are now going to contribute towards matching funds for some of our local construction grants. So that is, that's major. Uh, so good things are happening there. I think we'll probably expect a couple of photo ops before the end of the month. Went to CSAC, as uh, did as was mentioned by uh, Supervisor Sullivan, and he already reported out on the proposition, so uh, I should say that that safe neighborhoods and schools, I think um, while staff wanted us to take a uh, oh, neutral or no position on it, just the idea that you're allowed to put something like that on the ballot that doesn't tell the story. Anytime you say safe neighborhoods and schools, oh yes, everybody wants to vote yes, but you know, what they didn't tell you was that the way they were trying to get that way was by minimizing some of the, ex the sentences of people that had drug offenses um, that they were going to, and then uh, use that money supposedly to pour back into schools and neighborhoods, but they didn't say how. So it was just uh, bad, bad politics there. So um, we took a no position. After that meeting, we had a meeting at the Rural Caucus um, at CSAC to talk about going to the governor and pitching what he can do, what he wants his legacy to be on behalf of rural counties. We all know that you know, we have the resources, but we don't have the economy of scale, uh, and we certainly don't have the votes that Southern California, Marin County, or the Silicon Valley has. So we dis discussed some different issues, and then we were able to get into the governor's office on a moment's notice and met with Diane Cummings, uh, the governor's office uh, from the Department of Finance, and came up with a couple of really good ideas. 
uh, that she is going to support wholeheartedly and take to the governor. Obviously, one was PILT, uh, which is the payment in lieu of taxes, um, that finance, apparently the governor wasn't as aware of it as much as we thought he was, that it had been bottlenecked at finance, so now that'll get passed forward. But in addition to that, we made the, the, the appeal that rural counties don't have the money to improve their infrastructure like some of the urban and suburban counties do, whether it's bridges, whether it's broadband uh, for the um, middle mile, uh, or, or whatever that may be, fares. Um, so the concept a, of a infrastructure grant with no restrictions or minor restrictions to allow the communities, the counties, to use it for whatever they saw fit, not saying that it has to go for off-system bridges, not saying that it has to go for broadband, but opening up that opportunity for what we decide is economic stimulus, using it for infrastructure, um, that uh, she's going to support that, and hopefully that will be in the governor's budget in January, so we'll keep working on that. It's nice to have that kind of access on behalf of uh, rural counties. Participated in an agenda review, also had interviews with the new airport manager where uh, we had some great candidates, and stay tuned for who gets selected there. Uh, I want to mention um, that I also had a link sent to me and some discussions with uh, uh, John Thompson regarding, you know, John used to be part of um, Visitors Bureau used to be part of uh, our uh, the Economic Council of Economic Advisors. Thank you. And we have since tried to reinvigorate the Council of Economic Advisors, and, and I spoke with Jay a while ago, uh, that there is, in fact, in the past, we've had tri-agency. We've also had on staff here um, an economic development director. Well, Lake County did their own economic development plan focusing on tourism, so I sent the link to Jay, ask it to be passed through to the Council of Economic Advisors that we as a county, once we get a recommendation back from them, talk about that and see if maybe we don't want to follow this. It, it appeared to be a rather exciting boilerplate. Also had talks from constituents regarding curfew and staff is looking into, there's a lot of misinformation going on out there, whether we in fact do have a curfew, whether it was an ordinance that was repealed. Uh, so we're finding out some of these ordinances were back in 1953, some were redone in 1973. Uh, so we're checking on that. Um, before I turn it over to the CAO, you know, I don't like to do battle in the newspaper, um, but there was an article, a letter to the editor this morning that was flagrantly flawed uh, that had to deal with me. Now, part of my problem is, is I just go do the job and I don't stop to take credit uh, where uh, I had my hand in something. And if somebody else wants to take credit, that's fine. But when you don't tell the truth about my involvement, that's not fine. Regarding the um, signs for the vets at the uh, end of uh, the entrances of our community, the fact of the matter is, is it was brought to Regional Council of Rural Counties where I was in attendance by Les Baugh from Shasta County, saying that they had done it, they had passed a resolution, how they went to Caltrans, how they overcome the obstacles and were going to do it and challenged every county uh, that was at RCRC to do the same thing. I brought that information back to Jay Serena, our CAO, as the proper process, but also because uh, Jay's wife's grandfather is a highly decorated veteran over in Shasta County, and it just seemed like a great fit. I asked Jay if he wanted to contact um, RCRC to get a copy of that resolution, that would be fine, and he told me he would take it down to CDD, run through the proper channels, have CDD, the road department, work with Caltrans. That's the fact. I don't need to diminish anybody else's involvement, but I don't like people saying I had nothing to do with it because the genesis was right here. So thank you. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the CAO, and I'm sure he'll be able to back my comments. Yes, I agree. That was the process. You did bring it to me. Um, before I go too far, uh, Supervisor Hemmingson had made a request for some direction from the board regarding S SFAC. And I don't believe we had any, did we have a consensus? Well, you know, one way we could do it is, uh, it was brought up in a proper process. Jerry, is that a motion? Um, to give direction to staff to look into finding the availability of $500? Sure, you bet. Okay, is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, um, any discussion on it? Public comment on it? Okay, back to the board. By voice, uh, voice vote, uh, should so direction be given to staff? All those Aye. in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you, Jerry. You bet. 
Over the last couple of weeks, uh, we followed up on some of the board direction, uh, making contact with Caltrans regarding the 101 safety project on the north end of town, um, talking with a couple of the departments regarding the animal protocol that was brought up, uh, primarily to deal with wild animals, but also domestic. Um, had a meeting with uh, Mr. Fowler to discuss some of the issues that he's had. Uh, had an OES meeting. Um, it was the area ops meeting. We had also included a meeting regarding drought and the drought emergency and ordinance or the protocol that's been put in place by the state. Um, currently, there are no significant issues out there, but as this goes on, there could be some well issues for private properties. And it is possible that maybe a district could have a little bit of uh, issue, but right now, the larger districts, primary districts, Gasky, um, and uh, Smith River seem to be in good shape. Um, Hayuchi said that they were still in pretty good shape. Uh, did some research on the code of conduct as the board directed. Uh, we'll be bringing that back in the future. Had meetings with a number of people from the public regarding some issues and questions that they had. Uh, conducted employee evaluations and uh, also did the finalization of the budget report that's before the board today and attended the first day of school with my daughter. And that, very good, that budget report could be a booklet all on its own. <laughs> all right, at this time we're going to have public comment. Any member of the public may address the board on an issue that is under the jurisdiction of the board. Um, so if it's on the agenda, you might want to wait till it's brought up. If not, I invite you to speak to the board about such issues. Public comment, please. Hi, my name is Catherine Murray. <clears throat> I'm a resident of the city and the county. I come here today uh, for a very um, unfortunate reason, and I'm not very comfortable in sharing this with you, but I feel compelled to inform you of an incident. Um, and I debated very, very, I deliberated on this issue um, back and forth, but after reading a number of letters to the editor, um, I felt that it was important that you hear of, a, of an incident that I experienced um, at a solid waste meeting with um, the first district supervisor. Um, we had public comment, and after public comment um, at the Del Norte Solid Waste Authority meeting, um, the chair of the um, board um, felt that, that he needed to interject on his opinion about what public comment had been made and chastise the people in the audience for their opinion on um, what they regarded to be a well-functioning um, solid waste authority. Um, um, how, how it was run. Um, and so um, he chastised the public comment for feeling that they, the, the Solid Waste Authority was being run well and um, berated us for um, not commenting on the missing money. And so there was no um, opportunity to say that that issue had been resolved. So. Um, during the budget um, budget agenda item, I got up and commented that that was inappropriate because that issue had been investigated by the sheriffs and had um, been resolved, and indeed um, that there had been cash um, cash counted checks and that the money had been um, accounted for to the penny. So it had been investigated, resolved, and. Um, I was told that I was out of order, and I, I probably was, but I continued to talk. And so after the meeting, I went up to the chair of the, of the board, and I wanted to explain why I felt that it was important to say what I said when I said it. And the first thing he did was he looked over and he said, the camera's off. He said, I don't have to talk to you. Go on, get out of here and treated me as if I was something nasty on the bottom of his shoe. He, he was that awful. And I wanted to explain, I just wanted to explain why I said what I said. Now you're talking about a code of ethics and when you are treated that badly, when the camera is off, that is wrong. And I feel that 
that you should know that that's how I was treated. And when I shared this experience with other people, primarily women, they told me that he has treated them the same way. Now all of these accolades that he's getting in the newspaper, these are with people that agree with him. These are, so up. anyway, I feel that he should be removed from this board. He's not objective, he has his own personal agenda, and it's very inappropriate how I was treated and very disrespectful, and I was highly offended. Thank you. Any other public comment? No? Okay, I'm sorry. I thought, Ms. Kinney, you were going to, you're heading this way. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go to, uh, I think we might do budget transfers. We just, we just, we're going to close public comment. We just had it. Um, so let's, uh, let's open the public hearing to consider the recommended budget for all special districts um, and continue the hearing for 14 days. Consider attachment A, outlining staffing changes, including elimination and creation of positions as requested by the CAO. So I'm going to let you do your report and then we'll open the public hearing. Would you like me to summarize the report? Please don't read the whole thing. <laughs> um, yeah, it's quite long. Uh, the, uh, the board that is asked today to open the public hearing as uh, governed by government code and to consider the recommended budget that's been uh, uh, preliminary authori preliminarily authorized back on June 30th. There have been some changes, obviously. Uh, we obtained our year end and uh, there was a fund balance that assisted in us having a balanced budget before you today. Um, over the next 10 days, we can get comments and there can be some changes made. Um, it is uh, fairly tight in the sense that there are no significant reserves. There is a contingency that we've kept annually of $100,000 for emergencies. Um, in the sense of the entire budget, it uh, addresses the policies and goals that are in place uh, by the Board of Supervisors and have been for a number of years. It addresses dealing with uh, some of our partners and some of the contributions, such as the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Chamber of Commerce in Klamath, Visitors Bureau. Um, so at this point, we're asking to open the public hearing and continue it for 14 days. Uh, we're requesting that uh, you consider attachment A and possibly approve that today unless there are some issues with it, and we can always bring that back. The board could consider having um, any type of hearings or meetings between now and the 14 days and uh, if needed. So at this point, uh, I'd like to thank the auditor's office for a significant amount of work over the last few weeks. There have been changes at the last minute and uh, also the assistance of Mr. Young and Mr. Lopez and uh, all of the department heads that have worked on this. Good. So um, preliminary comments from board members before I open the public hearing. No? Okay. You can still speak during the public hearing, but at this time then I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing and invite members of the public or anybody to speak uh, to the budget that is before us. Anybody, uh, any member of the public wish to speak to the budget that is apparently balanced with a reserve without laying anybody off? Without a reserve, <laughs> yeah. but without any concessions. Okay. All right. then. Um, what we will do then is I'm going to bring it back to the board. We're going to continue the public hearing because that's the process. I believe it has to remain open for 14 days. If you have questions or comments, um, obviously you can talk to your supervisors. I would like to say we're as well informed as the auditor and as Neil and as Jay, uh, but we're not. <laughs> uh, so if you really want to dig down into the personnel and to some of the budgetary issues, please feel free to talk to staff and Mr. Shad, you as well. Um, do you want to take action on Exhibit A at this time, and would you explain what Exhibit A is? Exhibit A are staffing changes. Uh, they are everything from establishing positions to eliminating uh, positions that are not currently filled. The majority of these have been brought forward by the department heads and then have been vetted through the process. Um, there are a few of those that have some general fund expense added to the budget. Uh, some, most of these are part of reorganizations or changes in the structure of the departments 
in order to give them some support uh, for the year going forward and in the future. Uh, we are addressing um, some changes that have occurred last year and then this year in the assessor's office, uh, trying to deal with the uh, recruitment of a county engineer. There are a number of positions that have already been approved through Health and Human Services, and there are a few more in this one. Um, in addition to this one is trying to deal with some, some understaffing in county council's office, which has resulted in some of our, uh, uh, some slowing down of projects that have been brought forward by the board or some opinions that need to be done. But in general terms, it's a, a fairly short list of staffing changes that are recommended um, by the budget team after being presented by the department heads. So this is actually some of the basis for the balanced budget? It is. Okay. So if we do take action on this today, which would indicate that it would be appropriate, it still has to be considered as part of the budgetary process at the end of the 14 days to be reaffirmed or changed? Uh, if you approve it today, you don't have to take a second action on the budget okay. unless there's a change, and then we may have to manipulate it at that point if there's, if there's some sort of significant change in the numbers. Um, you realize you said manipulate with a union president standing here. Yeah, <laughs> and the uh, manipulation in this case would be changes that the board would bring forward or prioritizations that, that you might see. Okay. Um, I'm pretty confident that we've hit on the majority of those priorities, if not all of those. Um, they're based on the goals and policies, like I mentioned. We have committees that sit on those. Um, uh, the position changes have all been discussed with the union, so the president Good. is aware of those, and we've gone through that process. Board, what's your pleasure? You want to make a motion on Exhibit A? I move that we um, accept the staffing modifications of, the, of Attachment A. Second. Okay. Public comment. Questions? Back to the board. Further comment? I, I would like to comment that I was, um, I was excited to see the proposal by the, the assessor to have the aid and to have a training because so many times in our community we have good workers but they can't get their foot in the door. And by having the aid that can move through the, the department and eventually be certified, I thought that was a great um, a great addition to to the um, county employment. I also am happy to see that um, we're going to get some relief at county council with our 300 cases and the child welfare um, assistant on the, the legal clerk. I think both of those will allow for social services to be able to move through a system of appeals and, and cases with the children who need special attention, so I was glad to see that one. And um, I guess my only piece that I, it, this is my wish list piece in relationship to the budget, is that we start looking at a way to do the sal salary analysis for our employees because we need to um, attract and keep good people. and. If all were right with the world, I know that we would be able to be doing that. But I think that we should put it on our we should put it on our horizon and keep our eye on it in order to um, see what we can do for um, increasing salaries for our employees. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, I just have one comment. I know the comment of reserves was brought up. Uh, it would be nice if we started to to fund some sort of reserve put that as a uh, uh, on the wish list as, uh, as Martha says but um, it, it seems like we should have some sort of way of, of tapping into some reserves uh, if, if that's a possibility so just something to look at so it, did this budget take into consideration the monies that uh, out of the was it 19 million dollars or billion dollars that's owed to counties for pre-94 realignment um, we were due maybe only 60000 for just a Del Norte County. On a yearly basis? Or are yeah. you talking about the back? There was a million dollars that was put in by the, uh, with substantial amounts still left out there. Yeah, I don't believe we were given the final number at this point. Okay. So, it's so not that'll a, come into the budget come yet. In, yes. PILT, um, if we're successful next year, will then come a mid-year adjustment. Yes, uh, the PILT uh, at the federal level was increased last year, and we still account for the state PILT that's required to. 
Um, one note on uh, what Supervisor McClure had said. Uh, part of our agreement, which was a three-year agreement, we're about halfway through that with SEIU, is to do a salary analysis, salary study, and then look at ways of trying to implement that in the future. That, sure. that is on the horizon at this point. And then one of our goals every year is to attempt to get reserves, but uh, you know, number one is balance, and then second will be what the priorities are that we can expend on. So the motion on the floor before us is to uh, accept attachment A as part of the budget. Pull the vote, please. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Sullivan? Yes. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Chair Finnegan? Yes. Okay, so we have accepted attachment A. Uh, we will now leave the uh, public hearing open for the budget hearings for the uh, additional 14 days, at which time we will... Um, bring it back to the board for final adoption. So thank you for all the hard work that everybody's done it, and we'll thank you again when it's finally done. And with that, we're going to go to item number 14, which is a timed item for Caltrans District 1 presentation regarding the Highway 101 project. Um, calming projects, I guess, with the focus. Nobody's barking at us yet for this, the entrance to the south. Um, and I do know that uh, <clears throat> apparently the Chamber of Commerce helped uh, Host something with Caltrans, the Renner's gas station there, and, and uh, yes, we uh, did that on Friday. Both Gary, Karen, Coonrod, what I'm here today. Excuse me, let me introduce myself. My name is David Morgan. I am the chief of traffic safety for Welcome. Caltrans District One. Thank you. Today, I brought us my team. Karen Coonrod is the project engineer, and uh, Gary Johnson, he is our area construction engineer. So on Friday. The three of us, along with uh, Eurus Murtgat, which is the resident engineer, met with the businesses. And we think we've come to a compromise and that's amenable to both Caltrans and the business owners. So Karen is, is busily right now making some changes. And we're going to meet yet again with the, uh, with the, Gary will be meeting again with the business owners to make sure that those are okay with them. Well, okay? I, I certainly appreciate that. And I, you know, the board here is not without fault. This was pointed out perhaps by the newspaper that is something that has been before local transportation commission which is the joint powers authority between the city and the county and the public in caltrans but it never you know when we do an engineering project we get to see the schematics before the board or at least they're up in the board chamber and we never did get to see that so when right. the public came to us we couldn't have an intelligent conversation with them okay. um so uh, it's always better to be better informed i appreciate you coming to us i appreciate you meeting with uh, the uh, affected business owners and if everybody can be happy with this safety is the number one issue yes it is um, so any questions from supervisors so oh, we have a presentation oh to give fantastic you today. go ahead so creating a safe way to cross north coast with a pedestrian hydro hydrogen hybrid braking as you can see up on the screens next slide please wait i don't have a second yet there. okay good is oh is it up here Okay, a little hard to read, but I'll try to do my best here. Purpose and need for the project. Okay, lo location. Hey Dave, could I, could I get you to speak into the microphone? Nobody sure. Nobody can hear you on that. Okay. Purpose and need of the project. Uh, the location exhibited an above average frequency of accidents and fatalities. Caltrans created the safety project to reduce and eliminate the pedestrian fatalities and injuries at this location. The project includes pedestrian infrastructure and lighting. The project is consistent and within, included in the Del Norte County Gateway projects. The project is deemed a high priority by Del Norte Local Transportation Commission. Del Norte Local Transportation Commission asked Caltrans for a safety project review in 2011 after a fatal accident, pet, pet versus car. The project was initiated by Caltrans as a safety project in 2011. Next slide. What this slide shows is the type of collisions we've had out there. You can see specifically in front of the pa Patriot gas station and uh, Alicia's coffee house, there have been three PEDS versus car accidents. The two on the north end. Next slide, please. You can see where the fatalities. The 2011 one is the southern fatality, and the northern one was a 2007 accident. Next slide, please. Statistics, here's some general statistics for you about pedestrian versus collision, collisions in the US. 
I won't read this slide, it's kind of boring. Um, I will <laughs> note that on higher, higher speed roadways that are less likely than, cars are less likely to stop. So if you're 35 miles an hour or above, you know, it's most likely going to be a serious accident. One thing, that, um, the last bullet, it's, I feel like it's really loud, um, is that marked crosswalks, when they're just marked, they actually have been shown to be more dangerous than unmarked, where pedestrians just cross without a marked crosswalk. And so when we were looking at doing the crosswalk project, we wanted to add more than just a marked crosswalk because um, we want to make it safe. So just want to make sure you guys were aware right. of that. There is actually 80 feet of asphalt out there to cross, so it's a long ways across five lanes and a shoulder. And what Karen's referring to is, is the fact that, you know, certain people think that they're invisible when they put their foot in that crosswalk, and, you know, it's a pain to line on the road, so. Anything else? No. Okay. Next slide, please. Oh, I'll let Karen start from here. Scoping and design? Sure. Um, when we looked at this project, um, you know, there's obviously there's pedestrians, there's in a community, there's residences and businesses. So we are very aware of that. And we're also aware of the southbound traffic, the high speeds coming off of the freeway, the traffic volumes, the road is, um, like David was saying, 80 feet wide, and just all of the driveways. So the project location was pretty much set, I would say, or not from your Del Norte Local Transportation Commission, we were trying to be consistent with what was already programmed under your guys's or their project. Um, and looking at that, so we really didn't look at too many alternatives as far as relocating. I mean, we kind of did, but we looked at the driveways and where would this project fit. Um, originally, the project was programmed to just put in flashing beacons and in-road lighting. And as we went through the process of um, looking at the different types of flashing beacons we could use, um, this new system called a pedestrian hybrid beacon system has been approved by the FHWA and we got approval from Caltrans headquarters to use it here because of the number of pedestrians and just the location with the high speeds and the wide road and the, um, the condi existing conditions. It also actually stops traffic. Exactly. So it, legally it has traffic. red lights and the next slide. Um, so Somebody else helped us put this together, so we're both a little like, oh. Um, <laughs> we got it late yesterday. <laughs> um, well, basically, they've just, they have been installed all over the world and in other states, and this is one of the first ones in California. So, and then the next slide, if you can click on the screen. If you click on the black screen. If you go the back. There was a video, and that really shows what the system is. Um, do you have the other? Yeah, can you minimize this and have the other? Yeah. I don't know if you've seen the video, but oh, there it is. okay. <laughs> So that was from Fort Collins. Okay. So um, our project, 
we include a crosswalk and we're installing street light at the crosswalk, the pedestrian hybrid system. It will also have the pedestrian signals, which is the hand and the countdown timer so pedestrians know how long they have to cross. Um, we've also included advanced warning signs, which also include flashing beacons. They're about 500 feet north and south of the crosswalk. That will be activated when the pedestrian pushes the button. And we've also included um, additional advanced warning signs for southbound traffic, just a warning the traffic of this new system that they're coming to a signal. Um, and that sign will be located near, um, I forgot your guys' ramp. <laughs> I want to say park. Or Washington, it's Washington, Washington. sorry, yeah, Washington. Um, the project also includes bull belts. The bull belts are needed to protect the poles so that the traffic's not too close to the pole. You have overhead utility lines and there's a big four foot storm drain so we couldn't put the poles in the sidewalk. Um, the raised median island is needed to prevent cars from parking in the crosswalk to turn left. Um, and it's also just visible. And so it's the same, same thing with the bull belts. We're just trying to add more um, visibility to the crosswalk, even when the system's off to help vehicles slow down. And then we've also are including pavement delineation so that when vehicles are coming in at high speeds, they'll just see different pavement um, striping that they're approaching the system. Hey, quick question. Have you guys looked at, because I've seen Caltrans do this. I know when I talked to Charlie about this a few years ago, you guys weren't doing any colorized pavement on the side, on the shoulders. Have you guys looked at that on this one, particular one? No, and this, this project is programmed from our Minor B program, which okay. has very limited funding. So um, it's... Do you guys need some buy some paint? Yeah. Okay. So actually, actually this, pro this project will do stamp concrete for both the island and the... Uh, other things to get, give us a visual effect that you're not on the freeway anymore. What this will result in when we're done with this project is I believe this will slow cars down. And well, I know up in Bend when you get closer to it, they actually colorize both shoulders so it gets right. folks to narrow because the right. road appears to narrow anyway. Right. The, the ball bouts will actually be stamped with the brick pattern and color as well as the ball bouts. And like I said, that will ultimately end up with uh, reduced speeds. And then when I go back out there and do my engineering and traps, traffic study when that comes due again I suspect my speeds will be coming down which is good for the businesses as well people will actually end up probably okay. stopping more okay. David could I ask you a quick question I'm sorry I didn't get your name yet uh, Karen. Karen Karen thank you um, is there any not unlike coming down Crescent Hill is there any um, uneven pavement in a in a chronological manner which warns someone that they're coming into a slowdown traffic area have you considered that as a way of kind of warning someone from a vibration point that you're coming into a slowdown well, area well typically we put in rumble strip out there on highways and it's a little different it's we put it in both the center and on the shoulder that's typically to alert the driver that they're in a place they shouldn't be what you're referring to is more of a speed hump kind of thing an undulation of the pavement or something to slope traffic downs and that's that's not something Caltrans has done um, any time in the past that I can think of because our speeds are typically fairly high but in, in this case Karen wanted to bring this up and that is you know our highway is going through the middle of your town so we're doing our best to have a complete streets package here and we want the luminaires we want all pedestrians as the businesses do too they want the pedestrians to come to their businesses and buy and they want to leave safely so everybody agrees that you know, safety is the number one thing here. We want to make sure that when people cross that road, um, they get across the road safely. Thank you. Go ahead, Karen. Oh, just the next slide. The, those are the, the advanced warning signs. Um, and the next slide is just what we had planned in the, um, the construction plans, basically. Is that the abridged construction plan now? This is the original. We're still working on okay. modifying yeah. and okay. discussing with the property owners. Okay. Oh, yeah. Is that it? That's, that's if, it. Yeah. If, if I go could. ahead. Uh, and that's a, a, a great picture there. And, and I'm on the local transportation commission, and I do remember this project, but I was under the impression that the business owners were going to be contacted prior to this uh, construction. Did that not happen? Unfortunately, on this project, it did not, uh, and uh, uh, that's apology from uh, from us in construction. Our typical protocol is when a project is handed off to construction uh, that we put out a uh, 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 media press release and we go to any uh, property owners and or business owners that could be affected by the project. 
uh, this is a lesson learned and I'm uh, looking into that so it doesn't happen in the future. Yeah, because I know that discussion was had at the meeting that about the businesses and how they would be affected and, and we were, I was under the impression that, that there was going to be some sort of a dialogue or at least a notice sent out uh, stating what was going to happen so these business owners knew if they were going to be Typically impacted. Typically that, that is our protocol yeah. before we have contractors roll in and uh, start dumping off equipment uh, alongside the roads. So right. Unfortunately and this one fell through the cracks. Yeah. And the other thing was I was told it was going to be a Hawk system and now it's a PHB or is that the same thing? It's the same thing. Okay. okay. question I have and I've been talking to members of Caltrans for some time regarding when the the interchange was changed from Parkway and moved up to Washington to where you access uh, the 101. Mm -hmm. That more times than not, it's people on the freeway are racing to beat you coming off the off-ramp, and there's been some very close calls there because I think you have a, probably a 35 coming down the on-ramp and 45 people racing to the 45-mile-an-hour sign. <coughs> That's coming north. So that hits 45 before you hit your, your bulb outs, and then it goes to 35 just past that coming the other way the same thing is true people will race once you're past the 35 and you see the 45 heading towards the freeway which is about renter gas you race to that was there any thought given to put the 45 mile an hour further back down towards parkway and 101 or where you can egress to parkway or slowing down the traffic on the freeway after the exit to get to Walmart or Washington Boulevard, but prior to the on-ramp coming onto the 101? Well, let me answer that question, and that is, you know, the engineering and traffic survey is the speed limit law, and the way that they, the law says, the code says that I must post traffic is I... Right. And I wasn't asking for a speed study, because I know it would probably raise everything. <laughs> right. Well, that's, that's the way we legally change okay. the speed limit out there. And, and it's also, you know, I brought the fact that of the stamp pavement of the island, as well as the bulb outs, those are important items to reduce the speed. And I saw that out there when I was there, you know, last Friday, I saw people increasing speed going northbound and slowing down southbound. The effect of the island, the stamped island, with the bulb outs in there will effect effectively increase the friction. Okay. And I suspect I will end up sliding and moving those signs. Well, the Obviously, that's something probably to take a look at after it's built out. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay, good. Any other questions from board I, members? I do. My, I had the opportunity to um, enter and exit Williams Drive for 12 years every day. And um, it's just, it's, it's a nightmare to pull out of any of those areas. It's a nightmare to pull out of Totem Villa, out of Renner's out of uh, the Chevron, out of the gas, out of CDF. I mean, it's just, it, it's like this um, convergence. It's as if there were no uh, drop curbs because the entire roadway is one big drop curb where people are coming in and out and all of these roads and, and the ingress and egress is just, it's frightening. And, um, I'm wondering if you took into consideration any of that. For instance, the the um, shopping center, the Y the Y shopping center. Um, it has on the it has four different ingresses and egress, and they're within 15 feet of each other. And it just makes it so all of these people are pulling in and out within 15, 20 feet of each other. Joe's. Joe Chevron has two entrances plus a road. And, and so I'm hoping that you take a look at possibly looking at some of this ingress and egress because of all those accidents that you have, I think that the majority of the car accidents are actually because people are pulling in and out. And it's like it, it, the center lane is, is a true suicide lane there. And it is... Um, Unbelievable. I mean, I've been in the center lane turning in when the, all of a sudden there's someone else in the center lane because there's only about 12 feet between the two entrances that we're trying to get in. And so I'm hoping that that, that piece of the safety, because I think that that's where a lot of your accidents are happening. And I don't know if that's being considered. It seems to me that you just did 
focused on the pedestrian crossing and now we've even added two more where the big five's going in where there's two more coming in and out on that on that road well we have considered the ingress egress at the patriot station itself you know and i've had this discussion with the renters about if there was a big rig parked in front of your facility that anybody coming out of the northbound driveway there has no sight distance whatsoever and yes indeed i'm going to red curb that at least if i don't put the bulb out there and stop that so we've had some discussion about that and but not on a global picture that you're referring to the whole area i would really appreciate if that could be done because from washington boulevard to the first stoplight i think there's like 60 or 70 in ingresses and egresses in that what mile i mean it's it's and they're very very close and i don't know if we need them all so well, it's something to look at. I'm, I'm sure the business owners would have a lot to say about any kind of change to their ingress or egress. Yeah. I'm sure they would. Not sure they'd volunteer to give that up. I, I'm not. Know. I'm not sure either. But I think that that's the safety issue. Is that it is? It's just been kind of willy nilly on how access has been approved, apparently. So. That's my biggest concern because it, I literally drove that every day and felt like I was taking my life in my hands every time I pulled out from Williams Drive. Well, in traffic safety, what we typically do it, is every quarter we come out with what's called Table Bs, which what, that's a, basically a computer simulation is going down the road on all the facilities, Del Norte, Humboldt, Lake, and looking at the collision statistics. And if they, if they spot what they deem as a high collision concentration, then that gets forwarded to my office as well as all fatals, all fatals we investigate. It's one of the few things District 1 does that other districts don't do. But if it's a fatal collision, we will investigate it. So if I see high collision statistics that from broadsides or other issues like that. Well, it seems that you had some on there on your list. I had some on there, yes. This project's mainly about the pedestrian safety, just as you said, stated. So. Anything else? I want to thank you very much. I have a comment, uh, Chairman. Uh, I guess my question is to you, Jerry. You seem to be the public liaison person with the businesses that are concerned. Is that my understanding? I'm uh, the area construction. So are you talking to renters and you're talking to Alicia? Yes, sir. Uh, well, my concern continues to be southbound traffic getting access without committing some kind of an obstacle course route to get into the gas station, including trucks, and northbound traffic getting access to Alicia's coffee uh, without again meandering through these uh, ex perhaps extraordinarily long median dividers that you have so I'm an, I'm hopeful that you will uh, speak to those folks and get their input and take their input very seriously because commerce is at stake here and uh, they seem to think they'll be dramatically affected by the current project that you have on the table so thank you for doing that will we see a final uh, uh schematic like the one that you had that was being changed good yeah you can yeah that would include be, you that would be yeah. requested thank uh, you we're, we'll take that in front of the uh, the adjacent property owners as well as well that uh, that is the plan is for gary to meet them again but and then when you do that just forward it to the board upstairs so we'll have it up there we can take a look at if one of the constituents calls we'll be able to see it but Perfect. yeah the access by the way roger it was a concern of of you know the renters as well as Alicia and, and as I said Karen and I'm, and the staff here are making modifications such that everybody's happy that's that's good news and again we just want to keep these folks happy and we want to keep we like to get people stopping here getting their gas here and not going up to Oregon and likewise get a cup of coffee at the same time thank you thank you, thank you. thanks very much for your presentation which takes us to the next presentation, um, running just a little bit long, Department of Fish and Game Wildlife, or I guess it's not Fish and Game, it's Fish and Wildlife now, huh? Uh, Mr. Lancaster, I think the focus is gonna be on elk and elk management. Um, yeah, well, howdy. Welcome. Uh, Supervisor Finnegan, thanks for asking me out to share with you where we're at with uh, development of a statewide elk management plan. I've spoken to Supervisor uh, Gitlin in the past, I see again, and howdy to the rest of you that we haven't spoken with before. Um, but as I mentioned, the department is preparing a statewide elk management plan. Uh, the primary staff developing the plan are folks in Sacramento, 
and the regions are able to provide comments and, and recommendations uh, for the areas that they cover. So the area of relevance to you guys is what Sacramento is calling the North Coast Elk Management Unit that basically covers uh, Humboldt and Del Norte counties. Um, there's a very, very rough draft of this statewide elk management plan available, or excuse me, not available at the moment, but nearly complete. Um, there's been some initial review at higher levels. They didn't like how it looked very much, so back to the drawing board for the guy working on it. Um, as far as timelines go, I have a due date of uh, the end of this year to have recommendations uh, from me to my re regional supervisors that will then go off to Sacramento for, for informing that plan. Um, there isn't a due date set for completion of this plan. Um, but they're hoping to have it done not long after the first of the year, after they get the region's recommendations that they can fold into what they kind of already have going. Um, folks were interested in uh, what kind of uh, public input would be available for the plan. Sacramento doesn't have anything set up just now for how that will be done. They anticipate that there will be opportunity uh, but they haven't decided how they're going to announce that and how all that's going to work. Um, certainly, any comments or thoughts people have specific to the North Coast area, they can give to me now. And I've been meeting over the years with the different major landowners and some of the soups and have their ideas uh, that have kind of been folded in. And I can explain what uh, I have in my mind for recommendations at this point. Um, uh, approval of the plan. Uh, currently, what I hear from Sacramento, the plan will be approved based first, once the, the, they have a completed draft, it'll go to the regions uh, for uh, each regional manager's approval within the department, and then it'll go to uh, our wildlife branch in Sacramento for approval at that level, then it'll go to the director for approval. Um, they don't think that it will go to the uh, State Fish and Game Commission for their approval to lend with the director. Uh, and it's yet to be determined whether uh, CEQA analysis will need to be done on it. Uh, that's the Office of Administrative Law will determine whether it'll have to go through a CEQA process. Um, the different hunting regulations or management things that will come out that will have to be promulgated through regulation. It'll go through a public process. This is more a, a guiding document. Um, so anyways, uh, I guess you'd probably be interested to know what thoughts I have for what we do on the North Coast and what that would mean for Del Norte County in particular. So first of all, for a management objective for the North Coast for elk, uh, what's in mind is uh, um, having a well-distributed, robust elk population in areas where conflicts are minimal that provides for public use opportunities. So here's what this means. Here's my definitions. So areas where conflict are minimal, what does that mean? Uh, that would be defined as public land, industrial timber lands, um, and properties enrolled in the department's uh, PLM program. Uh, the PLM program is a program where a landowner gets tags that they can then sell to the public in exchange for doing habitat work that benefits wildlife. And a portion of the proceeds that they get for selling tags for hunters, they also get to pocket. So there's some revenue generation, there's some habitat improvement work, hunting opportunity, and typically hunting on these areas is fairly light. It's more of a trophy hunting kind of situation. So it's supposed to be a good for wildlife, good for the landowner kind of, kind of mix. So there's where elk uh, would be considered welcome, places where conflicts are minimal. Uh, other, other places, like much of, say, the private land in the Smith River Bottoms, uh, would be areas where we'd manage against elk. Um, very luckily, I think, we have a nice distribution of land ownership and private land um, management objectives that allows us to suppress elk in some areas and encourage them in others in a way that probably serves all three of the main public interest, uh, areas of public interest with regards to elk. 
three main areas of public interest for elk. One, uh, landowners that are incurring private dam uh, property damage that need relief. Two, uh, hunters that want to be able to harvest elk. And three, people that want elk for public viewing opportunities and to just know elk are out there fulfilling their ecological role in the environment. I think we, have, we can develop a plan that serves all of these very well. You can't always do that. I think on the North Coast, with our land distribution and things, we can, we can do that. We have enough places where elk would be welcome. Public land, and where they're already well established, primarily on parks. Uh, and industrial timberlands, places like Green Diamond, Humboldt Redwood Company, elk are already established, doing well. There's even room for them to continue growing and areas in our PLM program. Uh, we can maintain a well-established, viable population of elk on those areas um, while reducing elk to address property damage and they're in areas where they're not nearly as compatible with human activities like the Smith River Bottoms. So here's how it would look, in my mind, in Delnort County and how we'd get there. So we would have Green Diamond, for example, they're, they're the main industrial timberland owner. Elk aren't causing them any trouble up on their property. Good elk habitat, it's great. And above the slope from them is Forest Service. Hardly any elk on there yet. Habitat quality is much lower than the rest of Delnort County, but we'd like elk up there because it's a place where sportsmen can go hunt elk, the public can have viewing opportunities. Great, so there's some areas for elk. And we also have all of our state parks, uh, national parks, and a little bit of fish and game land here on the coast where elk can be for public viewing opportunities. Um, so what we'd have on those lands is uh, either no hunting on parks, for example, or light hunting on Greek diamond and up on the forest, especially no, not much hunting on forest service till they become well established. But we have hope for them to become established there for the public by hunting light on Green Diamond so that they can expand upward. Especially if we keep enough pressure on them down here, this low grass in the bottoms is gonna be a beacon for elk and it's gonna continue to be one. So we need to have measures in place down here to encourage elk to stay where they're welcome and to expand in areas where normally they wouldn't want to go as much. Uh, but if they're not welcome down here, they'll be more likely to go up there where sportsmen and the public would like to see them. Great. So what we'd have down here on the bottoms is um, uh, trying to maximize sport hunting opportunity to reduce the number of elk and provide landowners with a way to make some money on elk. And how we try to do this in the beginning is have a bull hunting season uh, that's where landowners tend to make the most money for milk for charging access fees uh, because it's the most desirable um, gender of elk for hunters to get because of the trophy value. So a hunting season for bull elk from mid-September to mid-October. That's during the rut. That's when hunters uh, want to go after them the most because you can call them. It's easier to harvest, that sort of thing. And then we have a hunting season from mid-October till the end of the year. So December 31st for antlerless elk. If you want to reduce an elk population, it's the antlerless elk that you really need to focus on because that's where all the babies come from. It takes very few bull elk uh, to service a lot of female elk to create <laughs> baby elk. So we'd have a bull season for landers to try and make some money and to try and reduce the bull population then we'd really work at reducing the elk population in the bottoms with this antlerless season. Uh, and then come the close of the general hunting season, what, we'd, what I'd like to have is a waiting list for hunters. Uh, hunting in the middle of winter isn't typically great for elk. It's when they're at their most metabolically um, challenged. Uh, the food isn't, there isn't around as much, this kind of thing. It's hard to have a lot of pressure on them then. Uh, but what we can have is a waiting list for hunters where we can target some specific animals causing problems. So a landowner can call up and say, hey, you know, I've got this group of animals that's still here following the general season, caused some trouble. We can have some hunters on a waiting list. If they can get there within 48 hours, we can get some of these animals taken. So 
anyways, we have a situation where there's plenty of hunting opportunity, a mechanism to get the elk population reduced in the bottoms. And now imagine we have this population reduced in the bottoms, but we still have robust, well-distributed elk population on parks and on industrial timber lands and hopefully forest service one of these days will move more up into there. There will still be elk wanting to come into the bottoms, of course. It's a nice beacon of green grass. So what we try and keep in place in there is kind of three-step options for what we do with elk in that situation. So we already have a smaller number of elk. We have places where they're welcome. Um, so you have a, an incursion of elk. They come in off one of these adjoining properties. Uh, the first step is um, I'd like the department to have first opportunity to capture those elk, to move them in places where we can seed them on private or public land where they're not well established yet, where they'd be welcome. And I don't want to be moving elk until I already have these other mechanisms in place that we were talking about for dealing with them when they come down into these areas. Uh, you know, you can move elk into an area and they may not stay there. They may pick right back up and then move on to another private landowner where they're not welcome. So we need to have these other hunting mechanisms and this kind of stuff in place to be able to address those challenges should they come up. But once those are in place, so the department has first dibs on one of these elk groups coming off of areas onto places where they cause property damage to try and move them out and seed them. This won't always be an option because of expense, availability of staff and resources, having a good place to take and that kind of stuff. But first take if that is there. The other step we go to, those landowners having trouble, aggressive hazing techniques. This is rubber shotgun shells uh, and rubber bullets, uh, putting dogs after them. So some intensive hazing effort. If that doesn't do it. That's legal? Yes. No. Yes, it is legal right now. Oh, sure. And we encourage people to use it for bears, trouble with mountain lions, all this kind of stuff. So this is stuff that's already going on. Um, so <laughs> some dogs are good at it. Some are more aggressive than if it's for their own good. Um, so aggressive hazing, if that can encourage them to go back on to say fish and wildlife lands, back to the park, back to Green Diamond where they're welcome, great. We don't have a problem with the bottoms being a sink where elk, where we want them, keep coming off in the bottoms and we just shoot them, shoot them and depopulate areas where we want to keep them. Great, so we try to encourage them to stay out of the area. Elk are very habitual. We put a lot of pressure on them through sport hunting and then this hazing. They're more likely uh, to spend less time where they're not welcome. But some just aren't going to play along. It's just, that's just how it's going to be. And so for those animals that won't respond to hazing, and it would be a normal working relationship between the department and the landers. So, okay, yep, you tried this hazing for this long. Yep, it's still these same animals. They're still staying on private land, still doing property damage. We already have that waiting list of hunters in place. You go, okay, we got six elk that won't respond to hazing. So we go down the calling, can you be here in 48 hours? Okay, if they can be here in 48 hours, and the landowner's good for having them on their property, they come on out, they take those animals. We just get rid of them. Um, and then the third step would be depredation permits. There'll be some situations, they're rare, but there's some, where particular animals need to be dealt with immediately. For example, you have a bull elk it's goring horses or cattle. Uh, you can't wait 48 hours for a hunter to show up. You can't ju always just use hazing because it's right on the stock. Doing, okay, we, we have a depredation process that lets the landowner take that animal immediately. Occasionally you have a bull elk that just raises all kinds of hell with fencing. Elk damage fencing, coming and going, that's normal stuff. But sometimes you have a particular bull that goes in and just gets in its mind. It likes tearing down fencing. It takes its antlers to everything. That would be a good use for depredation permit. We can take that animal quickly and be done. Let me stop you right there, Dave. Depredation permits and quickly don't seem to go together. They don't right now. Okay. But my belief is once we have all these other measures in place, measures where we're serving. Okay, so this is going to be part of the new management plan. 
Well, that's my right. This is okay. all part of what I'd be recommending. Okay. Correct. See, I think depredation permits will be a lot easier when we know exactly what context they'll be in, when we know that their use will fit a larger picture of management and won't interfere with these other goals. We already know we'll be serving uh, public use interests for just viewing or ecological interests. First, we'll be serving the sportsman's interest already. Um, we know that we'll have plenty of areas already established where elk are being taken care of just fine. And it's like, yeah, fits the situation, right? You want to open up to questions? Yeah, of okay. course. Okay, I've got, got a question. I'm going to just, I'm just going to apologize to you up front. I don't want you out the messenger, but um, you seem to be out of touch with our reality that we live in here. And I, one of the big questions I have for you, do you know the number of elk in the county? We don't have a scientifically so, what, uh, supportable. The, there's different qualities of data. We have poor quality data for this area. That's not to say that there's not an idea so I'm going to agree with you on that generally, one. but there's nothing scientifically supportable. So if you don't know how many elk are in the county, and I, I mean, how are, are you going to do a survey? Or do you have some plans to do some kind of head count to find out how many? Because robust, your definition of it, to me, translates to rampant. We have tons of elk in Delaware County. We have too many elk in Delaware County. And they're not going to Forest Service land because the Forest Service doesn't manage their property. They're, they're not going to these public lands that you want them to go to because you don't have open pastures. They're not going to go there. They're going to go to dealing with, and I'm speaking on the behalf of residents and ranchers and farmers that are in my district, District 3 and Smith River in particular. And we're having interaction with the elk on way too, too much of a basis and this hazing thing isn't working. So do you guys have plans to issue more deprivation um, tags? Uh, it just doesn't seem like a priority to fish and wildlife. Well, there's a few different points you're making there. Let me try to get to them. Well, I got, I got another question for so, you too after that, but go ahead. I'm okay. Sorry. Let me get your, to what I can keep in my mind at the moment. Sure. So first thing, how many elk are there? That's something people often go to as an initial question. It's a good initial question. It's not the key question in my mind. And here's why. We know that we have plenty of elk. No one disagrees. We know that we have too much depredation. No one disagrees. If you want to wait until we have good elk data, you're going to be waiting years. We don't want to do that. We want to move now. We have an elk management plan that's in the works to get rolling. Great. Let's not wait to try and make good management decisions. We have some information. It's not great but we have it and a pretty good feel for what's going on. You want us to wait till we have good information? It's a big pile of money and a lot of years. That's just what it takes to try to get a handle on what's going on with the elk and forested country. That said, uh, I'm trying to develop a proposal for elk, uh, for um, elk monitoring. Uh, you, you said elk weren't a priority for the department. Um, for putting much time and energy into, no, it hasn't been until recently. Uh, I can tell you, for example, for the amount of requests I get from the public, just for my time, uh, it would probably take, at minimum, a hard driving staff of 15 to so, even barely start to address all the things. Not just, but my program deals with all sorts of stuff. And of course, the, all you got is me. For better or worse, I'm it. So, Dave, and so there's been prioritization. Elk weren't a big priority. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but it, it, this goes to priorities of fish and wildlife, and this is where I have a big bone to pick with the director on that. Um, you pulled Joe Hobbs, who's your senior environmental scientist, off of elk management to focus on the gray wolf listing. The gray wolf doesn't live in California. So we're developing a plan for a species that doesn't exist here, and you guys have prioritized that over the elk elk species which is here and out of control I mean you can see where people call it fantasy land when you go down to Sacramento we deal with this on a daily basis the elk need to be a priority bigger than the gray wolf that is the most ridiculous thing that you guys would prioritize gray, gray wolf management and list them and not deal with the elk as you might guess your local biologist here doesn't have a lot of authority to direct other people's work in Sacramento I suspect, in my advice to folks 
in Delaware County would be to spend less time worrying about how things could have been done better in the past, but I'm focus just, it, on supporting, but to focus on supporting a proposal. Right now, you have an opportunity to provide input onto a proposal and a management plan that's gonna d guide what's done for elk in your county right now. You can spend this no, I'm just small window of time deciding whether it should have been a, an elk plan or an elk or a, or a wolf plan, but right now, the elk plan is being developed. So the and message I'm trying I would suggest, to boy, give us your input on how you'd like that All right. elk plan. So to we're going to try and do that. So yeah. I, I guess my, my point is uh, Sacramento needs to look at, at rechanging the priority levels. And I only use the gray wolf as an example. I mean, we're not going to beat that, that dead horse up basically in the process. But why are you guys not showing this as a priority issue? And I understand it is for you. But well, it is a priority issue now. So how do you draw a plan up without knowing the number of elk in the county? I don't understand that. I mean, it has to do with deprivation well, tags. I can, I can somewhat speak to that in that if you want to wait until there's good data, well, yeah, the plan can be shelved and we can just okay, I'm confused. do nothing until you wait sense. years for good data. Why isn't there good data. So we can't create data where there isn't any. But there, there already is a decent feel for how much depredation is going on. There's a decent feel for generally what a, a minimum, a minimum anecdotal elk population might be. It's not how many are actually out there, but from talking to landowners, from a little bit of surveys the department's done and some survey work that Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation's done in conjunction with the department in Green Diamond on Smith River. Eh, we don't know how many elk there are, but we know that there's at least this many. But again, a population number is something that, that captures the mind. It makes you want to focus on that. But that's not the main thing to drive all this. The main thing driving all this is that we have plenty of places where elk would be welcome. Okay, Dave, places I'm, that we know elk are well established. Okay, I, I apologize, but I think you're starting to repeat yourself. So I'm going to try to get to some sure. more succinct questions and more succinct answers sure. so we can get some of involvement course. from the public here too. Supervisor McClure. Thank you. Are you finished? Yeah, I'm, I'm not finished, but go ahead. I, um, I have some questions and then some ideas. And, but the first one is that you're asking for regional recommendations. And there doesn't seem to be a um, plan of how those are received. And so. No, I am the one that makes the regional recommendations. I know, but for us to make, for how is the, how, how is the public going to be able to input to you and who are you going to get direction from? I, mean, right. I understand that you have a good handle on elk and a, and a, and a, a nice idea of how we're going to deal with this, but th how are you reaching the people that are the boots on the ground and, ha and how, are, how is the public supposed to find you and make this a is comment. still an internal part of the process but so you said it's going to be ready by December so well, how are you making this is a for recommendation an internal draft and so what I was offering to you guys give me a call talk this isn't official public input there isn't an official public comment period at this stage but I've already met okay. with a lot of landowners over the years and very recently he's talking specifically about these elk issues Okay, so, so it's just an informal opportunity to give me your thoughts. Okay, so I have ideas on how we could probably do that because I think we need to engage the public since the report's going to be, the draft is going to be delivered to your agency in December and it's going to be what I would consider fairly weak on public, on public input since it's just informal. But we could probably formalize that process and hold some workshops that you would be more than welcome to attend, but we could get an idea of what to do. I also, um, you said that the draft has been circulated, it went somewhere and someone didn't like it. Is there a peer review on this or is it? No, this is all internal stuff. There, there actually isn't a, a complete draft for the public or for public distribution. This is all just being worked at 
at the internal uh, stage right now. Typically how this stuff works is a draft is completed by the agency and then it goes out for public comment. And we're still in the drafting stage. And what I was providing you guys an opportunity to provide informal comments to me if the supervisors want to provide that. Okay, and then on the, the um, depredation permits, how many requests have been made? Well, that's a tricky number, and that there would have been more requests, but there haven't been any issued, that's uh, what, at least that's on the North Coast for 20 years. And so, of course, many people with depredation concerns that would have made a request just haven't because they assume they won't get so one. So where is that disconnect? Because we know that we have big property damage happening, and we know that we have herds that are expanding into, onto private property that where they're not welcome. And um, if there have been applications for depredation permits, where is the disconnect in your department of why those permits are not being reviewed in an adequate manner and being issued? Well, the permits are being reviewed, but they're not being approved. Right, so there's a pro I need to know where that breakdown is, because if you've had 20 years of depredation permit request, and you have made zero depredation permits, we have a problem with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So where is that where is that disconnect? Who do we need to contact to say, wait, stop, you can't have 20 years of growing, expanding herds, and people are having problems with these, with these animals, and they're encroaching into, I mean, I was on Elk Valley Road, and they are in neighborhoods now. Yeah. And, and, but there's no depredation permit. So who do we contact, or how do we make that a priority. I understand the, that you don't get to do the priorities of what reports are done. Yeah, there's a clear chain of command. I can provide you the phone numbers for the people that you'd like to talk to. You can go from the lowest level, which is the boss over my head, Richard Callis. He supervises the biologists for the north end of the state, up through his boss, Karen Kovacs, or the regional manager on up to the How director. How do you get approval if there's no management plan in place, though? I think that's, is this uh, well, catch-22, so to speak? It may well be. There's, there's a fish and game code that directs uh, how and when depredation permits can be issued. That code that has a lot of undefined definitions. Most sections of code have regulation that helps guide how code is so implemented. So perhaps to cut to the chase, your suggestion for an expedited depredation permit in your new plan is something you should prioritize. I'm not sure exactly what you what you mean by that? Well, you talked about a mechanism for getting a depredation permit as part of your management plan mm. that you're developing, and I would um, suggest that perhaps it be prioritized. Yeah. So it can be done quickly. Part of, part of what I was talking years. about for, right, and, and maybe this is what you mean, uh, I was thinking if we had these other mechanisms that tend to be more uh, tasteful to other segments of the population. For example, there's those three in public interests with regards to elk I was talking about. There's the sportsman hunters, there's the private landowners that are getting depredation uh, concerns, and then there's the segment of the public that want elk for viewing opportunities and for ecological reasons. And my thought being, we could probably help get depredation permits quickly when they're used in the most effective situations and when the problem can be addressed in other ways that serve all three interest group for elk better. Depredation permits, they don't help sport hunters. They don't help people that want elk viewing opportunities. Having depredation permits is part of a larger plan where they have a specific role and we're taking care of the problem in these more publicly acceptable ways. Well, I, 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 do have, I do have some, uh, sorry, yeah, to yeah, I'm, I'm going to answer your question because I did find out the information. There's been 35 requests this year for a depredation permit. You guys have denied every single one. Well, and you have come back with, you need to put guard dogs, install elk crossings, install elk proof fencing, rubber bullets, bean bags, bean bag ammunition and cracker shells. None of those work. These elk are oblivious. They don't care. You can put that stuff up. They're still coming through. So if you guys had denied 35 permits just this year, I mean, that's, it's, we're eight months into the year, nine months of the year, and you guys have denied all of them. 
Well, two things to, to get at your question. So no, first of all, I don't know how you came up with that many permit requests. They, they come through me and you know, I, know, I can think of just a few, three landowners. Although I know many more want them, I've only had requests from three landowners. So I don't know where you came up with 34. I don't know what to tell you about that 35. for Del Norte. But uh, you talk about how these things aren't working right now. But imagine if we had heavy sport hunting, we had pressure on elk, we reduced the elk population in the bottoms with sport hunting, and then you already have these elk, they're kind of like eh, a little twitchy from all okay, sport so how do we get and there? And then you're hazing. How do we get there? And using rubber bullets and this kind of thing. It makes hazing far more effective. How do we get there in a well, timely manner? That would be from this statewide elk management plan having the recommended uh, plan that I described to you adopted into the statewide elk okay. management plan. So how many years ago was the requirement to have a elk management plan in your put into your department? It may have been 03. I don't okay. remember for sure. And we're probably over 10 years. Okay. So, um, so we, we know we don't know, we don't have the data on how many, we don't even have the data on how many herds and that's been since 03. And so to me, we need to, not only do we need to have this plan, but it's becoming pretty apparent through this discussion of the possibility that this county and Humboldt County, um, we need to get on the Fish and Game Commission's agenda and we need to go in front of them and we need to identify the failure <coughs> of, fish and game, of fish and wildlife to adhere to their own rules that were introduced in 03 to do a management plan and we need to probably go with go there and ask them for assistance in speeding up the plan because i think your plan is uh, your ideas of uh, like the the expanded hunting and that kind of stuff i think could could do a lot but we need to we need to probably get on the radar screen and i know that you being only one person, you're not going to probably be, have the juice in Sacramento or to get on the radar screen, but I think that poss there's a possibility that the county of Del Norte and the county of Humboldt, we could get on the radar screen by being in front of the Fish and Game Commission, asking for them to expedite this, asking for them to give you your 15 people and put the boots on the ground and figure this out. Because, um, Primarily, you know, we have a um, we have a, a very delicate economy in this part of the world, and every time when there is damage done to crops or animals in our egg, we our 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 teacup is is tipping, and so we need. I think that we have a sense of urgency. I have a sense of urgency about this. I can't speak for the entire board. But my suggestion would be that we would like to ask your department to see the rough review and that we then work diligently to get on to the, the commission agenda and make our case for what's happening in Del Norte County and the lack of management that has happened to no fault of yours. I, I don't, you know, one, one person can't, can't control 2,000 elk. And then my other, question is have you been in contact or discussion with the US Forest Service for meadow expansion because I know that we have a couple of high meadows that have completely because of their management practices have completely closed in and they're no longer they're no longer suitable for the elk but the elk used to be there but their management has in fact part of what I think we're experiencing is the Forest Service management has pushed these elk into the bottoms no. Uh, yes, I've spoken with the Forest Service for improving habitat there. Uh, elk have been extirpated from the Forest Service lands for a very long time. Mm -hmm. They came first, w the remnant population was on the park in northwest Humboldt County. They spread there from industrial timberlands and then came south down the hill and out of Oregon into the Smith River bottoms. So it isn't that it has nothing to do with the management of Forest Service lands. Elk have been extirpated from there for a very long time. 
but the collapse of the timber economy and the effect it had on private industrial timber and how much land they're opening on, on Green Diamond's <coughs> uh, Dillon Ork track there undoubtedly has caused some elk to come into the bottoms. So it's more the slowdown of timber harvest on industrial lands, not for So service. can we get a copy of your rough draft in order to be able to read it and possibly make additional discussions? We'd have to check with Sacramento. I suspect not, since it's not a rough draft that they even find acceptable. It's being reworked. Is it on uh, paper? Uh, I don't know so it's in your head. what it's in right now. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Hemmingson. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't want to go over a lot of the stuff that uh, everybody else has gone over, but who is the person that's denying the permit? You get the application, Yeah. and then somebody just above you is denying it, or somebody above No, that it's going well up the chain of command to the top of the wildlife branch in Sacramento. Who is that person? Uh, Martha said one person can't change Dan Perigary is the head of the wildlife branch in Sacramento okay, so that's he, probably reviewing these permits. So he's the uh, one. But the decision comes at various levels. The region and the branch have to work together on how they make these decisions. And you had talked about providing input to the department on having a deadline for when the plan should be done. That can, that can only help your guys' ends. It can only help. Now, one thing I would tell you is I wouldn't look at past prioritization of elk. You know, it's been a low priority until now. As for where we're at now, I can tell you, talk in the department, the support I've had internally for getting a proposal together, for doing surveys, support for doing an aggressive management strategy that I just described to you, that's being well received now. Before it was like, look, we've got a ton of things to do. Yeah, we have depredation, but there isn't that much of it in the grand scheme of things. We need to work on other things. That's not how it is right now. So things are turning in the right direction for you guys getting what you're needing. But the more you're involved, the more Good. it's going to help and the quicker. I just had one. Go ahead. I had just one more comment that the use of dogs, when I read Fish and Game Code 3960, it says that dogs cannot pursue large mammals but there's other code that uh, says landowners uh, can use hazing to protect their property and use of dogs is a bona fide okay. method for okay. uh, for hazing and it, it's used frequently I probably the 10 years I've been in this job I've spoken to many thousands of landowners in Humboldt and Del Norte this is something that many do and I've helped some of them do it and it can work well yeah. So, Dave, we've been at this for almost an hour. Sure. We've still got two more supervisors that have yeah. some questions. And I'm sure we have some members of the public, so let's try and shorten this baby up so we can get out of here today. Yeah, and, and I'm going to really try to shorten it up. Uh, I think it's imperative that we see a copy of the work in progress on the plan, on the management plan. Uh, you're yeah, throwing ask. something out there that you've got an idea. I don't think the public should have to come up with this plan, but the public is certainly going to have input on, on something that's a draft. And we need to see that plan. So that's, I think that's just imperative that we see what's, what's in the works now and, and how far we can, uh, what we can do to tweak it and, and make it uh, work for our county. It would be good yep. water for a workshop. Yeah, the fellow to ask for the draft would be the statewide elk coordinator, Joe Hobbs. Um, you can contact me uh, and I can forward the request for you or I can get you his contact information. You can send it straight to him. Supervisor Gitlin. Yes, uh, th thank you. Uh, Dave, you and I have spoken on this. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm seeing this issue is, is more than just a management of elk problem. I think every one of our supervisors gets calls weekly about explosion of raccoon problems. People don't know what to do. They call uh, the animal shelter, uh, animal regulation, that's not their job. Uh, they call the sheriff, the sheriff doesn't know what to do, and if it happens on a weekend, it's fully it's more exacerbated. I think what we're looking for in this whole conversation is direction and management. And I come from the school of the squeaky wheel gets the oil. I think you hear very clearly, we've got some issues up here, wildlife related, that we'd like some immediate attention to. So I hope you'll make that on priority and tell your supervisors that we'd like some action on not just elk, but on possum and raccoon problems that affect city residents and where this is going because we don't have anywhere to go. We don't know what to do. Uh, a couple things for the small mammals uh, that could be options for you to think about. One, uh, the private sector 
can address the problem. They can get a, a trapper's license from the department and do an extermination business just like uh, they do for any other, um, you know, rodent or, you know, insects causing them trouble. Uh, so the private industry can deal with that. There's a public sector way to get after that as well. There's an entity called USDA Wildlife Services. They're locally known as Federal Trappers. Humboldt County has one. Um, and he is available to help. He's paid some portion of his pay is from the federal government, some portion is from the county. Um, and he is available to respond uh, and assist landowners that are having problems with wildlife. Um, so that can be something for you guys to look into. It's something that you, co you contract with Wildlife Services Department of Agriculture with. So, Good. and um, also many of your constituents call me for advice on how they can deal with raccoons. Okay. And that's Let's partly why I don't have a nice survey methodology for elk prepared for you because I get yeah. hours and hours of calls a day about raccoons okay. under people's Okay, so houses. we're going to go back focus on the elk and I'm, at this time, Dave, I'm going to entertain questions or comments from the public mm -hmm. and hopefully you'll take note to some, of the, some yeah. of the comments and questions. The way it works is this is not a conversation between you and them. If there's some questions that need to be answered, they'll direct them to the board and we're going to forward them on to you. Okay. Okay. So public comment, please. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Uh, first off, I think my name's Ron Flicchetti. I'm in District 4. Uh, one thing that bothers me about this whole idea of doing a management plan is the lack of science they're going to use. They're going to go ahead and just make a plan up without knowing the population or any other dynamics with that, which we know is growing because of the amount of damage. Secondly, I'd like to mention an incident that occurred where a deprivation permit was asked for, and I think it was July. I, uh, are you David Lancaster? Are you met with the Fergusons who had complained that they had a elk that had wire tangled up in his antler and their fence was damaged and once, twice, whatever it was. And they asked for a depredation permit only to be hem hawed. I didn't see the elk actually do it, so uh, we're not going to give you a permit. And that's a bunch of nonsense because I'm reading the section here in the law, see here, uh, and you know how they interpret the law the way they want to in their favor as they frame all the arguments in their favor, is that they shall issue a permit, not that they may issue a permit or they can if they want to. It says they shall in section 4181. You might have read it. You know. Okay. Uh, section 4181, if I can find it here, says, subject to the limitations of B and D, the Department upon satisfactory evidence of damage or destruction, actual or immediately threatened, shall issue a revocable permit for the taking and disposition of animals under regulation adopted by the Commission, and it specifically mentions elk in that section of the law. So uh, I had a situation one time where I had a uh, cougar that I had videotape of, uh, claw marks on my cow where he attacked a full-size whole steak cow uh, that I bought from Blake quite a while back about 10 years ago and uh, anyway I had a couple calves with it and uh, the uh, I called up Fish and Game wanting to get a depredation permit because I had children they were pretty young then and uh, I, I was driving around my land with a 223 in my cab because if I saw it, I was going to kill it. I don't care what Karen Kovac said about me having to live with them in peace and harmony because uh, I ain't going to let my kids get hurt or my animals hurt, regardless of whether fishing game likes it. But I do need to say there is no chain of command. She told me I couldn't get, they wouldn't give me one. Uh, and uh, when the fishing game warden finally showed up a few days later, he said, just do it but no permit was given to me. So I, I'm kind of confused about where I would have been legally if I killed it and got caught uh, doing so, as I guess he wanted me to shoot it and bury it somewhere before anybody found out about it. So that's not how you do business. It's not the right way to do business. Uh, it should be there. It should be issued upon complaint. Guy wants to come out and look at it. Uh, it's going to have to take the word of the landlord or the wires were damaged, not by his cows, but by an elk. And uh, I disagree with the idea of not doing things properly and just half-ass uh, putting a plan together that may have a preservationist vet bent to it because uh, that's what Fishing Game's mission is and they won't bend for that. And we've seen this argument before with the Lake Earl issue and so forth. All right, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. So I think something to notate there is that part of this management plan has to have a clear, concise, and timely process for deprivation permits. Next, please. 
Yes, uh, I'm Blake Alexander. Um, I, I guess uh, I'd like to just start with a little bit of facts from my point of view and, and what's going on at our ranch there in Fort Dick. Um, five years ago, 2010, we, we got our first little herd of elk, and it was 43 head, and they moved on. They'd crossed the Smith River, maybe in Fred Haight Drive, from our ranch on that side and moved to this side, and they basically haven't gone home since. They've left a couple of times in, in maybe 2011 and 12, and they really haven't left in the last two years. Um, the population went from 43 to 53 in 11. Uh, 2012 was in the 60s. Uh, last year we had 97 elk on our ranch, 17 babies born. This year we've got 20 babies at least that I've seen so far, and we're going to have more elk. I haven't done the final count, but we still have 90 to 110 elk. And they're on our ranch every day, 365 days a year. A couple uh, 16 big bulls left and went and lived in Fort Dick around Redwood School, shedded their antlers, came out with velvet on. They've been on our ranch ever since. Set of 16 big bulls that left 15 little bulls in our herd. We've got 31 bulls, minus one last week. Um, that's just what I know and, and, and what's going on on my ranch. These elk um, have lived on our ranch 100% of the time until about 14 months ago they started bedding down on the state park land uh, during the day basically. In the early morning they leave our fields and they kind of shelter up in the shade of either the trees or the tall grass over on the state park land. And then when they're hungry they come to our side of the fence and they eat. And, and they do that every day, every single day. And it, it's expensive, um, you know, just at minimum it's $50,000 a year and it's probably closer to $100,000 a year in grass that we're losing to this herd of elk. And I can easily document that <coughs> because I, that's what I do for a living. Um, so the dilemma is two years plus ago we met with uh, the department and, and Dave um, Lancaster, we met both in Eureka, we met up here. We um, eventually became, we were going to do the private lands management pro process uh, after meeting with David. We were, would have been sixth in line for that. That would have taken a few years. Uh, we decided to get together with our neighbors in Smith River, which would be basically the two Westbrook families um, and us, I guess. Along with that, the Crockett's were involved and Rob Miller and possibly a couple others. But it was basically a lower Smith River Bottoms group of folks. We drew a couple maps working with Dave, a couple different versions of the maps. We agreed on one. And this was all two years ago, 2012. And then we went with that plan. That the plan would basically be that we increase the, uh, the number of elk taken in our region by 10 or 20 elk. And those additional 15 elk could be taken in a private Smith River Bottoms hunt. That's what David was referring to earlier. Although he didn't use these numbers, and that part concerns me because <clears throat> we had talked about taking five in October, five in November, and five in December. And so I'm asking you today as the board maybe to coordinate that ask so we can formalize that ask. And, you know, maybe it's 15 or it's 20 elk. I don't know. We have more now than we did in 2012, so we should be able to ask for more. So starting a year ago, we were told by the to department. Blake, ask you to wrap it up. Sure. We were told by the department that there were you know, environmental impact needed to be done. That wasn't talked about today. That concerns me because they need to raise the number of elk that are taken in the region, and they can't do that within the, without the EIR. And I don't know what's involved in that, but that part scares me. So we could be talking about this for years, um, and, and and so. Basically, we need to coordinate. I've touched base with those landowners again in the last two days just to make sure that I'm speaking on behalf of everybody. Uh, in terms of the count of elk in the, in the region, we've agreed that there's well over 1,000. Everybody knows that. There's no concern. Nobody's saying there's not enough elk. Right, so. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Victoria Dickey and I live in the county. Um, we have about five elk that live with us. Um, we chase them away, they come back, we chase them away. Um, they're pretty consistent. We also have 30 that show up now and then and last November we had about 60. Um, substantial damage, I mean nothing like I've just heard. Um, 
and by the way, I was very impressed with his numbers, uh, private individual actually knowing what's going on, government not. Um, I'm concerned about the deprivation or whatever they call that permit. Um, I can see myself getting one because we've had some serious problems out there. Um, one uh, elk the other day was deciding that I was fair game. Thank goodness I was in my car. Uh, shook my finger at him and told him what to do and he didn't like it. But anyway, um, I, I can see me getting one of those permits. I, I don't think I could shoot an elk. I don't know how I'd get rid of it. So if there is some kind of a permit that uh, is, is um, given, I would hope that there's a hunter that goes along with it. I don't know the procedure, that's what I'm bringing up. Um, also, uh, next door to us, a, a, an elk died, and for two weeks it was disgusting. It could hardly be in the area. My neighbor wanted to move out. Uh, there was a lot of discussion with everybody who would listen and those who would not. And the bottom line is that thing's up there rotting. Uh, they have all these plans for while they're alive, and we can't get rid of them. Then they drop dead, and it's our problem. That's something that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Oh, by the way, if they don't listen to us at the state, we still can become the state of Jefferson. So you might consider in the plan, Dave, something was brought up there is uh, disposing of dead elk as well. Chris Howard, District 3. I think the board is definitely seeing the frustration of the public. This has been around a long time. We've all been dealing with it. Mr. Lancaster has been dealing with it probably on a weekly basis, probably more than that. But the frustration is there and the frustration is very real. What I did want to make a point of is that Mr. Lancaster uh, last year directed me to talk to his folks that were developing this plan. I did spend time with him in Sacramento and got directed to Mr. Perigary and then to Mr. Hobbs and spoke to both. But after spending some time with Mr. Hobbs, Mr. Hobbs specifically told me that the component of the elk management plan specific for Del Dorant County was complete. And that was almost five, six months ago. So <clears throat> what I'm requesting the board ask Mr. Lancaster is where's the transparency in this process? The board should have heard from this by now, at least on the component specific to Del Dorant County, specifically on the component being developed for the Smith River Bottoms. The second thing, and I think you've heard this from Mr. Alexander, is where are we at with this in the CEQA process? Because at that meeting, Mr. Hobbs specifically mentioned CEQA because they knew they needed to raise the tag numbers here because within our region, there was only 30 tags available, which they've already maxed out this year during the hunt. Um, that's a real concern and that would continue that frustration. So those are the only two things I'd like to add. Thank you. Scott Feller, District Representative, Senator Jim Nielsen, and Mr. Lancaster, we've talked, and, and he is the Lone Ranger on this. He's got a lot on his plate, and it's very tough for him to do that. So I would suggest to the board that you contact the department in Sacramento and request several different things. One is that they complete their legal obligation under Section 3952 to complete their elk plan. That was enacted in 2003. It should involve lots of elements. The rural components, such as Del Norte County, it should have population census, we have previous experts in this, well, he still is in this county, a, a biologist who had his master's degree in population analysis on elk, Mr. Frank Galea, or maybe getting, as Martha and I were talking about earlier, Grant from Humboldt to get some master's students to do some um, elk survey work up here. Because in two hours talking with resource conservation districts and others up here, it was very easy to establish a very conservative number of 1,200 elk and their problems. So the problems are to be dealt with with section 4181 of fishing game code for depredation permits. Um, we had permit, permits issued in the mid-2000s to a local landowner out in, in the bottoms. They were issued on site when he made the request. Technically, under this section, they have to establish the viability of a herd before they could issue a permit. Well, you can't do that if you don't have a management plan. So there's caught between a hard spot and a rock. Part of this component is going to be the wolf. I have correspondence with Sacramento. Well. To bring the wolf into this picture, that's an introduction in Del Norte County, not a reintroduction. That's probably going to suggest a full sequel and EIR 
doing that because that's something totally different. So I think there's a lot of questions you should ask and to clarify a question on it was a request, the request for depredations this year have been for 35 animals and it's only three to five permits. Um, they were all denied. They were denied for the reasons you, the section you read. However, the department failed to tell them where they could get that stuff. The only places the cracker shells have been used in this county is at the airport and they're really hard on shotguns. You can't buy that ammunition in this county. It wasn't made available. Rubber bullets, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, where do you get that? It's usually designated for law enforcement. So I, I, I tried to find that and couldn't find it. So I think you have a lot of stuff on your plate that you should request the department. And if there is a draft plan for this county done, the rural component, uh, we need to take a hard look at it. We're going to be formally requesting it ourselves. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next, please. Any other public comment on this matter? Okay. Um, Dave, I think you, you heard the frustration. Uh, I, I think that you've heard also the con conflicting, uh, conflicting information and lack of transparency. That's one individual is told by the top fish and game that there is a plan and you're saying that there's not. There's apparently nothing in writing yet. And so I'm going to ask uh, our CAO <coughs> to continue the dialogue with you and perhaps what we need to do for while you're formulating this plan, especially with transparency and especially since it's going to be, CEQA uh, is going to pop into it. Well, not only do we draft a letter, but we want to encourage Fish and Game to hold local workshop meetings to hear from the landowners <coughs> who sounds like have the, uh, the information regarding the population, or at least a significant amount of it, uh, that could help you in your plan as well. So all I know is the elk used to be nice to look at 15 years ago, and now they're like rats. They're everywhere. Um, <laughs> well, I think we do need to draft a letter that requests the, the information or the draft information that they have now. Okay. At least get a, give us a chance to, to look over that. And, and another component of this, uh, Blake made a, a good point of it. When, when they lease fish and wildlife property, they pay a per unit price for their animals that they put on uh, fish and wildlife property. Maybe they should be sending a bill to fish and wildlife for the units that are on their property. I, that's, I think that's a good idea. So I think that one of the requests that was made, Dave, is that it is, is it Dave? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Was that uh, the plan um, expand the number of bull take for the, that first round of, um, of um, tags that are issued? That that number be very well identified of how many, how many tags are going to be offered? That that's, I think, what, what uh, Blake was requesting, so I think that we would want to see that in the plan. Um, I agree that we need to send a, a um, letter. If it's not possible for you to do a public workshop because your department is not, I think that the county should actually do a public workshop and get input and then present that to the commission. I also think that maybe we've overlooked a um, an ally or a person that we should invite. Uh, her name is Jackie Holster um, Carmens. Is that how you say her last name? As a commissioner? She's a um, fish and wildlife commissioner that sits on the commission and there are five and she lives in McKinleyville. We should probably invite her up for a little road trip and have a look at what's happening and that could be our introduction to the commission. Where we could get sure. that rolling. And my last one is, is that we need to ask either your department or we ask the county to approach um, Humboldt State to assist us in a, in a data analysis. And I, I have a couple of people that I, the resources there that I think we could get to the grant stage with their, with their department. So to me, those are the things that we need to do immediately and um, then we can make comment. But we, I think you're right, that it's not time to worry about what you should have been doing in 2002. It's what are we going to do in 2014 to, to, to turn the corner on this. Okay. And I would ask that uh, you know, one of our perhaps underutilized commissions as a conduit to the board is the Fish and Game Commission. And they should probably take the lead in the workshops and represent us um, and filter uh, communication of the public through them to the board. Uh, hopefully the board members will also attend. 
but let's utilize them on this matter as well. Do you need any clarification on anything you heard? Jay? Just, just another it's list? A pile of work. Okay. We'll be in touch, Dave. Appreciate it. We, uh, but right off the bat, I think we're going to shoot you a letter that we would like to see a copy of what you already down on paper. Thanks very much. Appreciate your time. With that, we're going to go to the consent agenda. Can I get a motion, please? I move that we accept the consent agenda. It's, second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, public comment on the consent agenda. Back to the board. Comments? Pull the vote, please. Just uh, one comment, uh, Chair. Uh, there seems to be a typo on consent agenda three. I think the text and narrative is correct. Just want everybody, the public, to know. It is not $1,789, it's $1,789,000. So, so we're aware the consent agenda item three, the typo there, and that's been corrected. Correct, duly noted. And the only comment I have is that we do have uh, Mark Raintree is here, who we're approving right now as a um, new member of the library district board. Wasn't it great to <laughs> Mark, do you want to say anything before we vote on you? Or, or you might oh, want to say it afterwards. <laughs> Welcome. Just, thank you. I just wanted to say I'm learning a lot and uh, very interesting. I'm looking forward to working with our wonderful group of people to make the best library we can here. So. Um, this is educational. Uh, since Boy Scouts, I think, was the last time I was involved in political service of any sort. So um, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Appreciate your willingness to serve. Pull the vote, please. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Sullivan? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Finnegan? Yes. Um, budget transfers number 10 and 11, which is budget transfer 0901 within the recreation budget for part-time temporary, and then 0902 uh, general fund contingency budget for a public defender budget as requested by the CAO. Can I get a motion? Move to approve. And a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Public comment on these items. Back to the board. Any comments? Pull the vote, please. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Sullivan? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Finnegan? Yes. Number 16 is uh, under general government consider revisions and adopt resolution approving proposed 2014 through 2019 housing element and resolution of the California Department of Housing and Community Development for final certification as requested by the planner. Randy. I promise I'll keep it very brief. Uh, as you're all aware, the, uh, the process to approve a housing element is essentially a six-fold process, and we are thankfully in the sixth step, so we made it. Uh, the first phase is the plan development. Uh, for that process, we engage with uh, regional stakeholders, identify different housing considerations that should be adopted into the element. Uh, the second stage is the public review process, uh, which in this case involved the planning commission, uh, public workshop. The third phase being the, uh, the draft review of the document, which uh, I presented to you in June. Um, at that point, um, it was effectively 90% complete. Uh, after that, we had a review, uh, which is our fourth step uh, from the California Department of Housing and Community Development. Through that process, we found out that there was about 10% of the document that needed to be revised. Um, the fifth step is the staff refinement. Um, through that process, we basically made the revisions that were addressed uh, or suggested by HCD. Uh, we did receive our uh, letter of basically that the, the draft uh, eight document was in general compliance with housing element statute. Um, and so that's what's before you again here today, our, our sixth and final step. This is the final approval. Um, just to highlight a couple of things through the process, we had a great community involvement. Um, there's a real uh, drive behind housing elements to really involve community interests, uh, things that the community would like to see in, in, integrated into the housing uh, plan that was um, certainly a highlight of this process. Uh, we did make every attempt to streamline the document that we received uh, or that we put out, uh, and, and I think those uh, efforts were recognized by the state through their letter. Um, and then finally, we completed the, the entire housing element in-house. So. Uh, that was at a significant cost savings to the county. Uh, the the uh, cost savings to the general fund, I think we had allocated uh, $10,000 to hire an outside uh, consultant to assist with that. We did it all in-house. 
And uh, we are um, proud of the document that we put out there. And as you saw from the letter from the HCD, they recognized the efforts that we put out and uh, that it was a, a very good document. If there's any questions uh, that the board has for staff today, we're certainly available to do that. I tried to highlight the revisions that, uh, that we made uh, from the draft to what you have before you today. And again, they weren't anything uh, major. It was definitely the, I would say the easier stuff to work on, which was a relief to, to us as staff to not have to tear the whole thing apart and start over again. So thanks. Well, I appreciate all the work that went into it. Um, don't mean to minimalize it just because we're at the end of a lengthy conversation <laughs> on some other things. Uh, it's not quite as large as the budget uh, discussion, but uh, people need to know just the amount of work that went into it. And congratulations to you and to your boss, Heidi, as well. Appreciate that, guys. Thanks a lot. Any other uh, comments uh, from board members? How about the public? Any, any comments on our housing element here? Okay. Can I get a motion? Uh, move to approve resolution 2014-2019 uh, housing element resolution to the California Department of Housing Community Development for final certification. Second. Moved and seconded. Public comment on this. Okay, it's back to the board and pull the vote, please. Supervisor McClure? Yes. Supervisor Gitlin? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Sullivan? Yes. Chair Finnegan? Yes. Chair Finnegan, if I could... Uh, Kylie, can I uh, make sure to reflect on the consent agenda? I, I need to abstain from number seven on that because uh, I have a conflict of interest. Okay. Last item before us is item 17, consider miscellaneous legislative and budget matters pertinent to the County of Del Norte. I think most of the budget questions are going to be asked and answered over the next two weeks. Um, as far as legislation, we are following a, a number of bills that have been forwarded on to the governor. We've weighed in through RCRC, CSAC, and our advocates uh, consistent with our ledge platform and the board will be seeing a revised ledge platform coming up probably at the next meeting good and I know that a lot of things are still fine-tuned we're still not aware of what the governor's gonna sign when he doesn't sign uh, so we'll stay tuned for that with that I would like to thank my fellow supervisors I would like to especially thank staff that worked on uh, the budget and, and every item that came before us and also the public that that hung in and um, participated so thank you very much we'll see you next time meeting adjourned <laughs>